Shalom Aleichem, Erev Tov. Welcome back after pretty much a month, a uh, hiatus of classes. Whenever I come back from Israel, I like to share a little bit about the adventures in Israel. For those of you who are in Kirat Shal Shamaim throughout the coming months of Dirashot and Shiurim and lectures and Shabbatot and everything else that we do, you will hear all about the different things that happen in Israel and what did happen and what didn't happen and all kinds of things like that. But for those of you that are here in the Kolel, the part that for me is most interesting to share is my favorite part of any trip to anywhere, and that is the visit of Jewish bookstores. Now, there are many Jewish bookstores in the world, but only in Israel, namely in Yerushalayim, do I find Et Sha'avah those books that my soul loves when I walk into a standard American Jewish bookstore, I feel very stifled. There are books being printed right and left, all the time, everywhere. But all of them are the same regurgitated, recycled, canned Torah that has been peddled in this country for the last 80 years, at least. Yeah, sure. Israel has... I don't go to those bookstores. <laughs> now, that's exactly right. Israel has such bookstores as well. But I don't ever find myself shopping in them. There are few little corners left in the world where you can find, even in America, if you look hard enough, where you can find a little bit of sanity in the world of books. Now, the famous wisest of all men said, Beware, my son, not to write too many books. And the reason that one shouldn't write too many books is perhaps because the more books you write, the more chances are that books will end up in what I call the dustbins of Jewish history. Books that are completely forgotten, books that people don't even read. Maybe they never even read them when they first printed them, but they definitely don't read them now. It's not just in those dustbins that I like to look for books, but it's in the people who value those dustbins so much that they reprint those books. That's where I find all of my excitement, but before I get anywhere, the highlight of this last trip for me, and you'll hear more about this in my Dershot for sure, was the much delayed visit to the holiest place on earth. I was living in Israel from 2008 to 2012. In that period, a lot about me changed. Namely, I became a student of Mori HaRav Yaakov Peretz, who, by the way, sent a book. And one day we'll study them together. The ways in which a person is supposed to learn Torah, the order, the books we should learn, those that we shouldn't, how to think, how to study, how not to study, uh, advice on studying Torah. We'll get there. This one, though, I have a copy. I have more than one copy of this. But this one I got the, the special inscription for me. So this is here just because it was my books. <coughs> At the end of my time in Israel, and I didn't choose to leave Israel. Israel chose to throw me out. I had this feeling that I want to go visit the Temple Mount, the Har Abayit. And it worked out perfectly for me that there was a group of people that I knew that were going up in a halachically appropriate fashion, the Har Abayit. And I said I was going to go with them. That was June of 2012. And then I got news that I actually had to leave Israel until I turned 26 years old due to complications that with the Israeli army that the Israeli army couldn't figure out. So the only solution was to leave Israel. And at that point, I was reading, I was thinking of the words of David HaMelech, Mi yale bahar Adonai, umi yakum bimkom kocho. Who is so presumptuous to think that they can go up on the mountain of Hashem. What type of person can go there? Niki chapayim, someone with clean hands, uvar levav, and a pure heart. Who never said my name in vain, who never swore falsely. And I realized, how can I go up to Harabait? A place which our rabbis made halachot, special halachot in order to show that we're not tourists. What do I mean to show we're not tourists? 
Halakha, going up to Harabait. What are you not allowed to take with you onto the Temple Mount? Chaver Halachot, what are you not allowed to go onto Harabait with? Yes. Halakha. Very good. With what? According to Halakha. No, you know something. Okay, leather shoes. A person cannot go up to Harabait with leather shoes. In fact, maybe not even with shoes at all. But at the very least, not leather shoes. What else? No, you need a mikvah. I'm not asking you what you need to go. What can you not take up? We build things on our bite. We gotta build with metal. To them is back. We don't build with metal. Okay, so no, no. Actually, it's not. You're allowed. No, there are places on Harabite you can bring dead bodies to. Yeah, women definitely can go. There, there's a halakha that we don't go up with your bag. Your wallet, your purse, that's the halakha. What do you mean by a purse? That which is outside of your clothing. Something's in your pocket, like a wallet, we're not talking about that. A money bag, a pouch, your, uh, what do they call that thing? Fanny pack, your backpack. We're not allowed to take those on halabite. We don't come as travelers. We don't journey on halabite. Halabite no is... No cameras. No, you can bring, you can bring drinks, and you can bring your cameras. You can bring, you can bring, you can bring... Meaning there's so many halachot that are connected to not disrespecting the place by coming as a tourist, I didn't want to come as a tourist. And I said, don't worry, I'll be back in Israel soon. And it was 10 years already. 10 years is almost 40 years. 40 years we got stuck in the desert. We thought it would take, you know how long? Put it into your Google Maps, your Apple Maps, whatever ways, whatever you use. How long it takes to get from Egypt? Choose a spot in Egypt. To... Yerushalayim, forget the border of Israel. Yerushalayim, on foot. How long? A couple of days. How long, how long does it take? 40 years. 40 years is not a trip. But we get stuck. We have this tendency to get stuck on coming back to Israel. <coughs> and this time when I was there, I said, it can't be, I'm going to be here again. Do you remember 2017? I was with you. I was in Israel for Tisha B'Av and I came back and I told you the most devastating part of my Tisha B'Av was to say keynote the morning prayers at the Kota. I came to the Kota. It was nighttime of Tisha B'Av. I feel like it might have been a Motei Shabbat. No, it wasn't a Motei Shabbat. It wasn't. I came to the Kota and I saw about 40,000 Jews there. You understand? 40,000 Jews. The Kota Plaza can fit 16,000 people. 40,000 Jews sitting on the floor and crying. Shana Beshana. Morning. About what? When we'll be able to go up to Harabai to build the Ben Mikdash? And I'm looking at the Jews. We're all sitting there on the floor. And the only thing stopping us to go to Harabai, when I said this in the United Kingdom, they told me I'm inciting to violence. I'm not inciting anybody to violence. I'm simply sharing with you a halakha. A Jewish thought. You're sitting on the floor of the Kotel, for God's sake. What is the Kotel in Jewish thought? Nothing. What is the Kotel? The Kotel is the outer wall of? Not the Bedemikdash. We have the mountain, Harabait, right? This mountain, our rabbis hollowed it out by building a wall around it, retaining wall, and then we built a plaza on top, and on top of that was the Bedemikdash. So what is the Kotel? All of those teachings that Chachamim say that the Shekhinah didn't leave the western wall of the Bet Mikdash. The western wall of the Bet Mikdash is not the western wall of the Temple Mount. But I'm not going to take away everyone's Kotel. The Kotel for sure is the place the Jewish people came to pray because it's the closest place the non-Jews allowed us. I'm not I'm avoiding them. They allowed us to enter because we weren't allowed to go to the Temple Mount. Right outside of the gates of the Temple Mount is a police station. It's called the Mahkamah. This place was once a court of Sharia law that was responsible. We have records there 
of Jews being executed for entering the Temple Mount. That's where they killed them. Today it's an Israeli police station. So we are in a self-imposed galut on the floor of the Kotel because we can't go up to pray in the Temple Mount because it's against Israeli law. Why is it against Israeli law? In 1948, we took over, we lost the Yerushalayim. In 1967, we finally were victorious. On the radio, how might be Adenu, the Temple Mount is in our hands, Rabbi Goren blows the shofar, blesses the Shekhyanu. Not so long afterwards, a man who was too busy looting all of the antiquities of the State of Israel, Moshe Dayan, was a general, so I'm not an army general, so I can't appreciate his uh, bravery at war. I can appreciate all that he didn't do for the Jewish people. He gave the Temple Mount to the Waqf. Who is the Waqf? It's a Jordanian Muslim authority on the Temple Mount. So it's a foreign entity. The Waqf is the same one who met with Adolf Hitler, Yemach Shemov And wanted to learn how to get rid of all the Jews with Adolf. That's right. So what happens? We give the keys to the Temple Mount to them. And then ban ourselves from the mountain. And what, is, what, can, what can only be the craziest thing one can do, but here you have rabbis who don't want Harabait. You have the Muslims that don't want us in Harabait. You have the Israeli police who are terrified of World War III breaking out in Harabait. And so who wants Harabait? Clearly everybody at the Kotel, right? They're all crying about it. But the only thing stopping them, 15 police officers. You know 40,000 people are? Why are you sitting on the floor of the Kotel? And I was devastated. It broke me. And I came back here and I said, Bezat Hashem, when I can, I'm not going to be from those people anymore. This year, I went up to Halavite with the help of a wonderful organization I'll share with you later. That's busy advocating for Jews going to Halavite. They've advocated so well that you're talking about a couple years already now where there are minyanim every morning on Halavite. I pray Shacharit seven times, six times, on Harabait, without a talit and tefillin, because that's a federal offense. It's illegal for Jews to wear talit and tefillin on Harabait. <laughs> or bring a sidur or anything else, but you can pray from your cell phone. That's right. Al-Khanan came with me every single morning. Every single morning to pray Shacharit. I went with my family twice. Now, of course, all hell breaks loose. How dare you go to Harabait? How could it be that a Jewish person goes to Harabait? How could it be that Jewish? Let me explain. I already studied with you this. So for those of you on Zoom, we had a shiur on Shabbat. And the writers of Rabbi Chaim David Halavi. It's a simple Mishnah. Open up the Mishnah, Masechet Kelim, that talks about Eser Kedushot Hen. There are ten levels of holiness in the world. Israel is holier than the rest of the world. Yerushalayim is holier than Israel. The Temple Mount is holier. Inside of the Temple Mount, there are different levels. There are places on the Temple Mount that are Tamim Mit, that a person who has touched a dead body like you and I without a paraduma, without a red heifer, are not allowed to go. That's true. But there are places where we are allowed to go in the Temple Mount. That's an explicit Mishnah. The Rambam rules that way. There is no argument. It's a very, it's a very explicit Mishnah. What do we have? We don't know. We don't know where the Beit Mikdash stood. So we don't know where the places are that we can go. So we don't know and we don't know and we don't know. Rabbi Akiva. What is the famous Midrash? Tisha B'Av. Rabbi Akiva is walking where? On the Temple Mount. On the ruins of the Bed Mikdash. And he sees a fox in the Holy of Holies. All of his friends begin to cry. Because how could a fox be in the Holy of Holies where even a Kohen Gadol would die if he walked there? And Rabbi Akiva? He's laughing. Our rabbi is asking Rabbi Akiva, why are you laughing? So the crazy person laughs in a horror movie. What are you laughing? Yeah, he said, until now, I didn't know if the prophecies of the redemption would come true. But now that I see the prophecies of the destruction came true, now I certainly know the prophecies of the redemption will come true as well. What do they say? Akiva, you consoled us. Akiva, you consoled us. Where is he walking? On Harabait. You have stories throughout the ages of Chachamim going to Harabait. The Rambam seems to have gone to Harabait. They made a festival out of that day. They want to say he didn't go to Harabait, he went to a very big synagogue in Jerusalem. I'm sure that's exactly the reason why the Rambam made a festival for the time that he went to the big synagogue in Jerusalem. He never saw in his life a big synagogue before. 
Not in Egypt, and not in Syria, and not anywhere where he was, never saw a big synagogue. Being sarcastic, of course. The Radbaz is writing exactly where Jews go and don't go. But after 1967, Rabbi Shlomo Goren made it his mission. Actually, I have all the books that I brought, I, didn't, I don't have his. Where exactly Jews can go, according to all the opinions. And so we have these books that I brought here. Ayeh Mekom Kevado. These are contemporary books that, whose whole purpose is to chart out Habibites, to tell you where Jews can go and cannot go, meaning without a red heifer. So I can show you here. You have the Temple Mount right here. Yes, the Kotel is right there. That's the Kotel. So this little bit is the Kotel. This entire plaza is the Temple Mount. If you can fit 16,000 people in the Kotel Plaza, you could fit 20 times that on the Temple Mount itself. The last Muslim holiday that was there, there were a quarter of a million people there. They all fit. I mean, there's room. By the way, I walked there, I told you, seven mornings. And I counted 12 or 13 people on the Temple Mount. Aside from the Jewish group, who was about 50 people. Because you can't go in Jewish groups more than 50 people. So, so you can't go. And because of that, I counted who else was left. Nobody. All of this. Now, where can't you go? I mean, the Beit Mikdash was right here. This red area is the red area where you shouldn't enter. So what do we do? We come up here, and we walk all of this. At a certain point, we pray. It's the first time in 2,000 years Jews are praying in Harabayit. They say when you go to Harabayit, you go, if you go, God forbid, to the forbidden places, the consequence is spiritual excommunication, right? Karet. Someone said you get karet from the kote. After you pray here, you can't go back anymore. You, you, you know, how do you, you pray in Harabayit. I wash the hands of a Kohen. A Kohen. On Harabayit. For the first time in my, I'm a Levi, for the first time in my family's history, 2,000 years. And we're fighting for a basic right. They say there's apartheid in the state of Israel. And they're right. There's one place in the state of Israel where Jewish people are not allowed to enter on certain days of the week and certain times and certain hours. And if they go, it's only with a police escort. And if it's with a police, freedom of religion, there's no sidurim, there's no talitot, there's no tefillin. I'm not saying to throw anybody off the mountain. But why can't I pray there too? In which, in which democratic country do you have places where people of a certain religion cannot enter? And that's enforced by the police. So these books are intended to show exactly where people can go on Harabayit and where they can't. All of this conversation of we don't know, we don't know, there's no reason to worry, according to Halakha. By the way, even when you go there, they hand out a map to you. These are not the police, the Halakhic organizations there. They'll show you exactly where you can go, what you can go. They say there are no Jewish sites over there because, of course, there never was a temple. There's some 22 or 23 things in broad daylight. You see them from the temple, from the Ben Mikdash. Yes, Allah. Like that marble stone that on the floor that doesn't belong from to this era, belongs to that of the Bidim Mikdash. Like pieces of pottery that you can see everywhere. You can see the wood that Hiram, the cedars of Lebanon, are there. They've been carbon dated. You can see them with your eyes. They're sitting out there to rot in the sun and in the rain, covered with a few blankets. Amisal has to wake up a little bit and talk more about these types of things. Uh, there's a book I got from Chon Mikdash, from the Temple Institute, about the Evan Ashtia, that stone that the world was created from, according to our rabbis. This has nothing to do with anything, but it will be a great segue into the next section of books because they're not all about the Bidim Mikdash. Is that what it's covered by the yes, exactly. That's the same stone. Uh, that stone, they claim that's where the Prophet went up uh, with his donkey, we, for us, that place is where the world was created from. That's where Avraham Avinu brought his son, Yitzchak, to sacrifice him. That's where the Kain and Hevel are very good. That's where the first Ben Mikdash, the second Ben Mikdash, where the third Ben Mikdash will stand. That's, that's the place. And you have an absurd relationship in the Jewish people of this hatred of Harabite. Next time you pray, it's interesting to pray, notice how many times you talk about going to Harabite. In Tehillim, for example. Think about all the... 
to bow down on his holy mountain, to go up to his holy mountain, to pray in the holy mountain. Think of how many times you say it. And yet we don't do it. We're allowed to do it today. We don't do it. Oh, Hashem, there's more and more Jews. The groups that I went up, groups of 50, 50 this year at Tisha B'Av, almost 3,000 Jewish people prayed to How can you talk about a destruction of Ibn Migdash without being conscious of the fact for the first time in Jewish history, almost 3,000 Jews were in Bayt. There are 7.5 million citizens of the state of Israel. 5 million Be'ach that are Jewish. From 5 million, we got 2,500. At the Kotel, there were 40,000. Just to think. It's intended to provoke. Now that I'm on this topic. I want to read to you from the writings of Rabbi Moshe David Gaon. And if I don't get through all these books today, guys, that's okay. I brought back 150 pounds of books. Not including what I brought in my backpacks. My dad laughs at me that I'm going to have to take them back to Israel one day. But for right, for right now, I'm the, the biggest private exporter of books to San Diego. We're okay. Rabbi Moshe David Gaon, the father of uh, Yoam Gaon, the Israeli actor, musician, was the secretary of the chief rabbi of Israel, was a Tamich Ram. He has a book that he wrote on the Ma'am Lo'ez. Not a commentary on the Ma'am Lo'ez, but the history of the Ma'am Lo'ez. How did it happen? How did it evolve? As you know, the book was first written in Spanish, in Judeo-Spanish, in Ladino. And then it became translated to Hebrew, and then new books were written. He writes in the beginning of his book, Sfarim Rabim, many books, Kvede Mishkan, heavy volumes, Nichtevu al yidei chachmei v'rabanei asfaradim b'meot ha'achonot, were written by Sephardic rabbis in the last centuries. Chiburim b'alei erech safruti v'histori yadua, books with tremendous literary and historical significance. Mehem sheishiru roshmam al atkufa, some books that completely influenced the generation and some books that are completely forgotten. And many books whose names have entirely been covered up by the dust of the generations. It's a fact. It's a fact. A very sad fact. That in some dark attics and basements of former world centers of Judaism in Sephardic countries, there are books, thousands of them. Treasure chests of spirit, of rabbis and scholars with a great name. Shebehem hushka avoda sikhlit moftit rabat ma'amatsim. Books that rabbis and scholars invested the peak of their energy and their intellect in that almost challenged all human intellect. Due to our laziness, our mismanagement of our national treasures, we lost many, 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 many manuscripts that were precious of rabbinic literature. Because we couldn't find anyone to take care of them with the compassion they deserved. Nobody who cared to go gather them and bring them home after their authors died. He talks about the yeshivot that were still standing in the Sephardic countries. And some of those yeshivot, which are still left in the countries of the East, I can't read that word because of the bad print. There are entire volumes and stacks of books that are covered in rot and mold. Nobody even opens them. And there's nobody who wipes off of their face the disgrace of being orphaned. And I said, from inside of those books, 
מתוך החיבורים הללו, from inside of this box, יציצו רבנים בעלי קומה. There are rabbis of great stature that are peeking out at us. עם פניהם העדינים והמביעים אצילות והוד. Rabbis whose gentle faces show aristocracy and beauty. אשר השאירו לדור אחרון את פרי רוחם בירושה, those rabbis who left us our inheritance. עוד מעט קאט. So just a few more moments, says Rabbi Moshe David Gaon. וערימות הספרים התלולות הללו תמכנה. These piles of books will soon completely disappear and disintegrate. תושפל נא עד לעפר, they will be lowered down to earth, והיה גורל החיבורים הנזכרים וכתבי היד הרבים כגורל מחבריהם נוחם עדן. And they will return to the same place that their authors rest into the earth. What we try to do here at the Bet HaMidrash is to the best of our knowledge and with the limited efforts and energy and resources that we have to give kavod, respect to the Chachamim that made us I saw in the writings of a contemporary rabbi that rabbis who invested their lives to make sure that we would be here today we have repaid their kindness with apathy and that apathy has caused for thousands and thousands and thousands of volumes of the writings of Chachamei Yisrael to disappear. And when I say the writings of Chachamei Yisrael, I'm focused, yes, in a very particular group. Those who I believe if their Judaism was alive today, we would not be plagued with the problems that we have today. My wife is writing an article we printed soon about secular education and general wholesome education in the Sephardic communities of yesterday. We're talking about Chachamim that studied mathematics and science and medicine, engineering, I can't, the, I can't even tell you. And today we look at a Sephardic rabbinic world in which we're lucky to find a rabbi who graduated <coughs> elementary school. And we've replaced a superior Judaism with something so far inferior that hasn't done good for anyone. It has given to a rise in fanaticism in the Jewish community, of craziness in the Jewish community, of an unviable, unsustainable Jewish world. And the solution is right here, but it's hidden because we don't care for them. When I say we, I'm not talking about us. We're here, obviously. I'm talking about Am Yisrael. And so what I wish to do with you tonight is to walk you through some names, some books, some places, some things. And all of these books are going to influence the shiurim that are coming in the coming years. Some of these names you've heard before in my past shiurim. They're new books from the same authors that you've heard already. Some of them are new. And so if I talked about the Bet HaMikdash, the Chon HaMikdash, and I don't know what their motivation is in writing this book. The Chon HaMikdash put out recently, I have a copy of this book in an old printing of like 300 years old. It's a tiny little book this big. I'm so afraid to open it because I don't know what will happen to the pages if I open it. This book is a very small book. It's called Darchei HaTalmud by Rabbi Yitzchak Konpanton. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correct. Uh, Rabbi Yitzchak Konpanton was born in Spain, Castilla, in 1360. He died in 1463. So you're talking about a Chacham who's very old. He wrote a book. He was a Rosh Shiva. He was a Kabbalist. He was a physician. He was a mathematician and also a politician. So he was all across the charts, a classic Sephardic Chacham. And he lived in 1360 to 1463. Spain. Spain. In Castilla. His students, you may know some of them. Rabbi Yitzchak Abu Hav, the famous Marie Abu Hav. There's two of them, so which one I have to check? Rabbi Yitzchak Karo, that's the uncle of Maran Rabbi Yosef Karo. Rabbi Yitzchak Arama, the author of Akedat Yitzchak, seems to have been a student of his. After the terrible Gzerot that were in Spain in 1391, this is a hundred years before the Spanish expulsion, he made it his mission to get as many students as he could to study Torah. And he made a little book showing how is the proper way in the classic Sephardic tradition to study Talmud. Because he saw that the way that people study Talmud is entirely incorrect. And it leads people to make terrible conclusions based on the Talmud. Grave errors. So he wrote a tiny book. 
and it was intended as a textbook for his students. Here's the rules, now I'll show you how to do it. The problem is, over the years we have the rules, but very few people who can show us how to do it. And I didn't even have a chance to evaluate this particular book, but uh, this book is printed in the beginning. You see it's very few pages. And then Rabbi Yaakov, Rishael Ariel, who is the rabbi of Mechon Mikdash of the Temple Institute, he spent the rest of the book taking classic examples from the Talmud and showing you how to restudy them according to the writings of Rabbi Yitzchak Kompantor. So this is one of those books that if and when we study the Talmud together in a deeper way, likely we will refer to these books. Yeah, I don't think you can get them anywhere in the United States. Yitzchak, now is your hard part. I'm going to ask you to choose any stack from that table, except for the one with the little book on top of it. Choose anything. The, oh, the biggest stack is good. All of them are good. You tell me where you want to start. Here? Great. Here's going to have some books that I was going to like. Uh, it's like I'm going to give you this. Maybe I could put these. Maybe you could put them on the, somewhere that we're not going to get confused. Yeah. These? No, I'm going to take them back home. <laughs> I brought the suitcases. <laughs> The next books on my list are from the Institute Yad Harav Nisim. You know Rabbi Yitzchak Nisim. He was a Sephardic chief rabbi of Israel. We spoke about him a number of times in our different shiurim. His printing press, obviously he's not alive anymore, prints some of the more unique books that belong to the, this school of thought. And so just a few of them so you can know what they're like. Uh, recently, Professor Shaul Regev put out uh, a commentary on the Torah, like the Rashot and the Parashah, based on classical Sephardic Chachamim. I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, but it looks very interesting. Chazut Kashe, this is a book by Rabbi Yitzchak Arama, the same Akedat Yitzchak that you've probably heard of quoted in the Torah, uh, from 1420 to 1494, he lived in Spain. Uh, this book is a work of philosophy that seems to be, I haven't read it yet, intended to combat Christian theology that was floating around the Jewish community. Uh, Akedat Yitzchak is a beautiful commentary in the Torah. It is from the non-Rambam camp of, of Spain, so you do have to be aware of that. Uh, he's a very interesting personality. If you've ever read the writings of Professor Nechama Leibowitz, she quotes him extensively. She had a, a lot. She quotes uh, Rabbi Yitzchak Arama. Uh, this book is a beautiful book. Let me. This is the one I think Zev is going to I don't know what it's called. Oh, there, there is in this translation? Yeah? Beautiful. Okay. I think uh, Rabbi Monk did that one. Is that? Yes. Okay, I might have it too. Um, Rabbi Raphael Mordechai Malchi was born in Italy in 1640, died in Jerusalem of 1702. He was from a family of Anusim, <coughs> of crypto Jews, who, I meaning he grew up a Christian. And then he ran away so that he could live his life openly as a Jew. What year am I talking about? 1640. Remember that the Spanish Inquisition closed their doors in the United States of America in 1927. There was a Catholic Inquisition office in this country, in New Mexico, until 1927. It's still there, by the way. They just changed the name of it to hunt non believers. Yeah. So, but for sure. I mean, 1640, you still had families that were a few generations. They knew they were Anusim, but they didn't live in a place that they could practice Judaism. So many of them, think about Rabbi Menashe ben Israel, who runs away to Amsterdam. Perhaps one of the rabbis of Baruch Spinoza, intentionally or unintentionally. They run away to a better life, but not everyone can make it. They leave their families behind. Rabbi Rafael Mordechai Malchi comes to Yerushalayim for a better life. He's a posek, he's also involved in politics, and he's also a doctor. A medical doctor that he studied when he was still a Christian. So he was able to go to university and study medicine because he wasn't Jewish officially. He brings this knowledge with him to Israel. And if you want to know some of his famous family members, he had a son-in-law, Rabbi Chizkiah de Silva. Have you heard of him before? He wrote a book called the Pri Chadash. It's one of the foremost commentaries on the Shulchan Aruch. His other son-in-law, Rabbi Moshe Chagiz. Rabbi Moshe Chagiz is the son of Rabbi Yaakov Chagiz, who's the founder of the first Sephardic yeshiva in Jerusalem that is teaching secular studies, that is teaching philosophy, that is teaching sciences, that is, something fascinating. 
Rabbi Moshe Chagiz becomes one of the most vocal opponents of Shabtai Tzvi. This is his father-in-law. He writes books on Halakha and other things. The book that's in front of me right now, by the way, he writes that there were so many Sabbatheans, so many Shabtaim in Yerushalayim at the time, you couldn't even tell who was Shabtaim and who was not because pretty much everybody was a Shabtaim. You almost weren't left with people who were not Shabtaim. This is his book on medicine. So he left behind a work on, on medicine, uh, character traits that a Jewish doctor needs, not just how to practice medicine, but bedside manner, musarim for Jewish doctors. Um, I don't, as if this is your department, <laughs> my department. He has here, Chochmata Dofek, so um, pulse reading. He has a chapter on pulse reading. Uh, sciatica, he has a chapter here, how to determine the diagnosis of different patients, birth, brit milah, uh, and then some things to do with a little more spiritual side, uh, dreams and the like that could affect people's uh, personalities and uh, other such things. I'm, I'm going to actually send this your way. I don't know if there's anything in English, but who knows, maybe there's something. Yeah. This book is a, these books are totally out of order. This book, Bnei Yisrael, was written, I mean, do you want to look up for me the year Tafresh Gimel? What year we're talking about? Tafresh Gimel is a Berg. Matayim. Okay, Tashach is a Shabbos one. Okay, as Mesha. It's about, it's about 270 years old. The books begin to be written. This is a book that is put together about the question of the Bene Israel. Have you heard of Bene Israel? Not us. Bene Israel. Have you heard of this group? It's a, Jews, a Jewish group from India whose origins may be from Iraq. They lived alongside the Jews of Cochin and others. And when the state of Israel was founded in 1948, these Jews from India wanted to make Aliyah, but nobody was sure if they were Jewish or not. Now this question is not a new question. We have many Chachamim that dealt with this question already. Uh, Chachamim from uh, Calcutta, Baghdad, Tzfat uh, already. And then... Early on, Rav Uziel and the others, and this book is a collection of all the teshuvot that were written about the Judaism or the Jewish status of the Bnei Israel. I'm not mistaken. In 1964, the chief rabbinate of Israel determined that the Bnei Israel were Jewish to make Aliyah. Uh, I don't know. I don't actually know what the Rabbanut did or didn't do. If there was some kind of mass giur, you know, the Rabbanut is capable of all kinds of things. I'm not sure. This book is from the same printing press. Also from Professor Shalom Regev, Harama Misaloniki, the Rama, not the one that we know from Europe. The Rama is Rabbi Moshe Al Musnino. He, yeah, very good from Saloniki. Uh, he was a rabbi in the 1500s. I own almost all of his books. A uh, very unique personality. This is a book about his life that I didn't have. It's almost the piece that draws all the strings together. These three books are Piske Halacha that have come out from the writings of Rabbi Yitzchak Nisim. Last time I was in Israel, I bought four books. Uh, this year there were three more that came out. So these are collected writings of Rabbi Yitzhak Nisim that have been coming out. Nachat uh, Avot is the commentary of the Barbanel, Rabbi Yitzhak Abravanel, on Perkei Avot. It's been beautifully redone. And I hope that next summer when we study Perkei Avot, that we might use that as some of our insights. Two more books that came in the stack. Ordin, uh, attorney Moshe Nisim, former member of Knesset, is the son of Rabbi Yitzhak Nisim. Uh, he is a very influential figure in Israeli politics. He came to meet us at the first day of our rabbinic convention in Yerushalayim. Uh, we spent a day with him then, and then again at his father's yard site, which always falls out, his askara, always in the nine days. He shared with me a copy of this uh, conversion in Israel report and recommendations. He, in the year 2018, decided to recommend to the state of Israel a halachic and legal approach to the conversion crisis in Israel. It's his, he has a Hebrew and an English. It's a fascinating work, whether Israel will ever accept it. <laughs> Likely not. Uh, but if anybody could recommend something from a legal perspective, as an attorney and a member of Knesset, as well as a Tamil Chacham and the son of the previous chief rabbi, this would have been the way to go. On the same topic, you may have seen on Facebook that I met with a dear friend, Professor Tzvi Zohar. We've been communicating for a number of years, but we never actually met each other face-to-face. -face. Many Zoom calls. The Hashem will be coming here in November. 
and this is not a, a pitch, but it is a pitch. If we want him to come here, I just he's not taking money from us, but I need to help him get from a flight from Mexico City to San Diego so that he can he can make that work out, Bazar Hashem, for him and his wife. They'll spend a Shabbat with us, we'll be able to learn some wonderful, wonderful Torah. And by the way, she she is not a pushover either. Her her she has her own claim to fame, but you may know of her father uh, from his work on restoring the Keta Aram Tsuba, the Aleppo Codex. He's the one who's been reprinting all of the volumes. Uh, Professor Cohen, yes. Uh, but both of them will be coming. He speaks English fluently. He's born in the United States, from Brooklyn, uh, though he also speaks Hebrew fluently. Beautiful. They, they grow. All the fruits we ate, all the fruits we ate at his house, they grow. Everything. Everything. Uh, if it was figs, if it was sabras, uh, cactus fruits, if it was uh, uh, grapes, every, apples. So he wrote this book many years ago on conversion to Judaism and also signed a copy for me. It's his theory of how we have such a convoluted conversion system when it's so far removed from the Judaism of yesterday. Okay, that's stack number one. You have Koch for stack number two. <laughs> oh, that's a good stack, it's hard. Thank you. <laughs> Could have been drugs, right? There's a, there's a word in Japanese for buying too many books to possibly read in I think someone did the math that to read their library, they would need 596 years. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and not all these books you read cover to cover, but sometimes you're reading something and all of a sudden I need 13 books that if I didn't have them, definitely nobody in San Diego would have them. That much I can tell you. All right, let's start from the top of the stack, in no particular order. These two books were written by a famous rabbi, Rabbi Yaakov Moshe Toledano. He was the chief rabbi of Tveria. He was... Yeah, I'm going to tell you in a second. He was a minister of religion uh, in Israel. He was a controversial figure for many reasons. Uh, but... I had an article I was going to teach you this summer, but I didn't get to do it, on gun rights in halakha, according to Rabbi Yaakov Moshe Toledano. Uh, something fascinating, the story of Purim and the ramifications of that in halakha. If not this summer, the next summer, Bezalat Hashem. Uh, this book, Sarid Palit, is Rabbi Toledano's collection of ancient manuscripts that he found in different places, and then collected them. Some going back to the Rambam, some going to other places. If I'm not mistaken, this may be that place where they try to tell you that the Rambam's father ate donuts on Chanukah or something like that. If I'm not mistaken, this book has a connection to that legend, which is obviously not true. But <laughs> uh, There were definitely academics who did not like this rabbi dabbling in manuscripts, and there are those who claimed that he was a forger of manuscripts. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't know either way, but uh, as a Tamil Chacham, we definitely know him, he wrote books on Halakha. This book, Ner HaMa'arav, is a book that he wrote on the history of the Jews of Morocco, uh, in particular, through his lens and, and the different stories that he knew firsthand. Uh, it's a fascinating work, and it's very, very important for understanding much of what happens in the Judaism of Morocco. The next five books that I have here are all about the history of Morocco. That's why they're in the same stack. There is a famous Chacham, Rabbi David Ovadia. You may have heard of him. He only passed away in 2010 was the last of the Moroccan, almost of the last of the Moroccan Chachamim, who lived in Morocco, was an Abedin in Morocco, and then came to Israel. If I could show you quickly. Uh, that's the wrong book. If Hashem will help me find it, I will show it to you. At a different time. Uh, look, these are the. He, Rabbi David Ovadia came to Israel and made it his mission to record Minhagim and history, everything you could possibly record about the different communities that he served as the chief rabbi of in Morocco. I could give you his years and his life. Rabbi David Ovadia was born in 1913 and passed away in 2010. 
So if you think of which rabbis you were listening to from 2000 to 2010, he was living in Yerushalayim. He was one of the famous opponents of the Alliance, the Kol Yisrael Haveri movement, meaning this puts him in the camp of a little more conservative Moroccan rabbis as opposed to some of the others. Um, he wrote a famous book, Nahagu Ha'am. I showed this to you last time in the last video that we did together. Uh, all the minhagim of different chachamim in Morocco. He was buried alongside his dear friend, Rabbi Shalom Masas, the chief rabbi of Yerushalayim. Uh, this is him in his younger years, Rabbi David Ovadia. In his later years, you find him in Yerushalayim. They say that he had the face of an angel when you saw him. Uh, Rabbi David Ovadia, this is a, a school in Morocco, all the school children that he, one of the schools that he started. Uh, I wanted to show, this is the girls. Um, there was pictures of, with Rabbi Yosef and Masas that I wanted to show you. But if I can't find them now, then I will show them to you privately. Maybe you can find, no, skim through this book. Yeah, you'll find some pictures of a bunch of rabbis sitting together. There's like five of them, so if they're not on that page. He wrote a number of books on Fez and the Chachamim of Fez, called Fez v'Chachameha. Uh, he wrote a book on the community of, I don't know how to pronounce it properly, uh, Sefro or Sefro uh, in Morocco. That was a place where he was one of the chief rabbis. He was, he was in Rabat. Um, I don't think so. Look, you'll see Rabbi Yosef Masas in it. Also, those are coming, something like that, but maybe on one page. You met someone from? Fez. Fez. He was, he was uh, Muslim. But he said it's right next door where the Jewish. Oh, here, but it's in this book. <laughs> That's why. And the Muslim school. Next to each other. No. One second, yeah? Yes. The red arm and the picture on the, on the, on the book. That's him when, as the Dayan of Morocco, chief rabbi. And here you find a picture of him. Yes, here you find a picture of him sitting together with Rabbi Yosef Masas and some other rabbis that likely you've, whose names you've heard. And he was a very influential figure in the life of Moroccan Jewry, not just in Israel, but helpful in rebuilding the Kehillah in Israel. He had a yeshiva in Bayit Vagan, which uh, many of the graduates and many of the rabbis that studied there are very famous. The final book. The Samaritans use? No, it's a different red hat than the Samaritans. It's, a, it's unique to Moroccan Chachamim. Uh, the ones the Samaritans wear, look at them closely. Put in Rabbi Yosef Masas, look at his hat, and then look at the Samaritans, they're different. Uh, this book is a fascinating work that was written over the period of a thousand years. So the Ibn Dinan family of Morocco is one of the more prestigious rabbinic families there. Rabbi Shaul Ibn Dinan, Rabbi Shemuel Ibn Dinan, a lot of Ibn Dinans that were part of this family. They collected over the years many, 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 many manuscripts, historical writings, biographies, diaries, all kinds of things. And now in this generation, they took all of those papers together and published them in the Ibn Dinan thousand years of Jewish history. Notable is there are 10 synagogues around the world which are uh, UNESCO heritage sites. One of them is the synagogue of the Ibn Dinan family in Morocco. And if Amir um, passed some of these books around, these books have nice pictures. Uh, they finally managed to get it done. And uh, they had all kinds of dignitaries and chief rabbis that came to visit there. Uh, there's family trees in the back. It's important because if you think about how many Batei Knesset we've left around the world, how few of them are actually protected heritage sites? And who, who's taking care of them? In so many of the countries that we left, there are no Jews left. And so this was a, a very special endeavor that they undertook. Uh, I want to hand out, just so you could look at them, in these two books, just take a look at some of these pictures. They're, they're going to, especially if you know a little bit of English and French, you'll appreciate this. Chavri, you have uh, energy for another stack, maybe? Okay. Can I can't bother you for a paper towel, maybe. I'm sorry, it's a little warm. Oh, okay, good. Why did you take all these books back? I mean, it looks like you left hundreds of them. 
looks like it would fill more than a suitcase. I brought back three and a half suitcases. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful handwriting. Yes, a book, Marlene. A book. Not this stack. Let's leave it for maybe if we have time at the end. Please, of course. This, this is for you to look at. I brought them to share. Oh, this is a nice stack. And a quick one, too. Much of what we pray is not understood to us. Not just because we don't know Hebrew perfectly, but because... Did you bring me this water, Itai? Thank you. It's good as well. Because sometimes the words that our rabbis use are not so simple. There are words. I'm thinking of silichot. We're saying all kinds of words that we don't always have in mind. What's your example you always tell us? Um, That word, certain words that are alluding to other texts, biblical texts, rabbinic texts. The birth of Avraham Avinu, that's right. Without it, without the thing, I wouldn't know. Even though it's not Hebrew, it's just chapter and that mentioned. So we've been talking a lot about tefillah and the importance of having kavanah during tefillah these last couple of months. And so part of having kavanah, very simply, is to learn the sidu, to learn. I have a special part of my library of commentaries on the sidu, different parts of prayer. Sometimes you'll hear me, like in the Berakas, I'll tell you, you know, this prayer is a very ancient one, or this one is a new one, or whatever, because you have to know a little bit about the world of tefillah. Perhaps the oldest Sephardic Sidu that it was used in the communities unanimously, almost all of the communities, of the East at least, was the Sidu called Bet Oved. Bet Oved for weekdays, and Bet Menucha for Shabbat. There were a few other Bet, there was a Bet Moed for Sukkot, and then he died, and other people did the rest of the work of the batim, of the houses for other holidays. But the two classics are the Sidu Bet Oved and Bet Menucha. Uh, Ahavat Shalom put out a brand new edition with a gorgeous print inside. I used to read from this cryptic print. Uh, what was special about this is not just the, the fact that it's a Sidur, but it has a commentary by Rabbi Yehuda Shemuel Ashkenazi. He's the one who wrote these books. Rabbi Yehuda Shemuel Ashkenazi was born in 1779, 80 and died in 1848, 1849, so about 100 years before the State of Israel was established. He was a rabbi in Tveria, then later in Italy, where he, his sons opened up a printing press. His sons likely were not such great printers because they made a lot of mistakes in the original edition of the printing of their father's book. Uh, Rabbi Chaim Palaji talks about how quickly, already from when this book was printed, it spread around the Sephardic community for simple reasons. It was a Sidur that came along with instructions. If you ever saw a Sephardic Sidur, or really any Sidur from a hundred years ago, a few hundred years ago, they were very cryptic. They would tell you, you had to flip around a lot of pages. You had to flip here, flip there. Kaddish is only printed once in the book. The, everything was very hard. And unless you were an expert in the Sidur, you didn't know what to do. He essentially wrote a Sephardic Kitzur Shulchan Aruch and embellished it onto the Sidur. And so, not just as a matter of prayer, but between every section of prayer are halachot, and the poskim of later generations. I'm thinking Rabbi Chaim Palaji, I'm thinking the Ben Ishchai, Rabbi Zofrein Baghdad, I'm thinking the Kafa Chaim, Rabbi Yaakov Chaim Sover, Rabbi Ovadia Hadaya, Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, all of them refer to the halachot in this book as a book of halacha. But it's almost impossible to read many of the older versions, and so I was very grateful to be able to get my hands on brand new editions of these books. Tell me. They're not all wearing black hats. Oh. <laughs> Very kind. Right? You know this? Somebody once said that they like they look like people you wanted to know. Some people you see their pictures like I don't, I, I don't ever want to know you. Like stay away from me. In the same spirit I have a commentary on Selichot by Rabbi David Shalush, the famous Rabbi David Shalush. Unfortunately, a number of years ago, I refused to buy his commentary in the Chumash because the volumes didn't all match. They were random, you know, how Sephardim print books. One was red, one was blue, one was big, one was short. I said, let's wait till they reprint them. They never reprinted them. I don't know if they will ever reprint them. Uh, but at least I managed to get whatever else I didn't get. Uh, these are commentaries, the Fiyah Pshat. So the literal meaning of words, as Rabbi David Shalush understood them, along the Selichot. In the same genre 
of commentaries on Sidurim, I once taught you about a famous Yemenite Chacham, the Maharitz, Rabbi Yichye Salach. Salach in Hebrew today, what that's up. The Maharitz, <coughs> you heard about him in a few contexts. One, we studied a letter of his about the forcing of Omer mourning customs in Yemen. It's called on my YouTube uh, Halachic Colonialization or something on YouTube. We have this, uh, I, t- I taught him once here in a Kolal class. Maharitz, I also taught about him in my class in the Chavura about Maran HaShulchan Aruch. You see, when the Shulchan Aruch came out, the, essentially the Yemenite community was ripped into three. Yitzhak, you know what I'm going to ask you? To bring me the stack. It has three big red books inside of it. Yeah, you see it? The Yemenite community was torn into three. Those who were diehard, we follow the Rambam, we don't care about the Shulchan Aruch, they labeled the Shulchan Aruch and the Sephardic Sidu as the Sephardic invasion of Tzfat. The Tzfat is invading Yemen and they didn't want any part of it. Think about Rav Kapach and his family were diehard Rambamists. They don't care much for this invasion. By the way, in the same stack, these books, Chuvota of Kapach, Letters of Rav Kapach, I now have volume 5 and 6. Every time I go to Israel, they write more. There's only about 15 letters in each volume. His student takes every letter he wrote to Rav Kapach in handwriting, then they reprint it in the original handwriting. Let me try to find one for you. Here. They reprint Rav Kapach's handwriting. You see that? And then he explains all of the sources behind how Rav Kapach got to that answer. Rav Kapach will say, like, it is allowed. But he'll say, why is it allowed? And he'll bring all of these sources. This student is a rabbi in Israel. He keeps writing more of these volumes. So the Kapach family, diehard Rambam. You had another family, Rabida Zahav, Rabbi David Mashraki, Yeah, Rabbi David Mashraki was otherwise known as Rabbi David Mizrahi. He was a fan of all Yemenite Jews which follow the Shulchan Aruch. He wrote a commentary, three volumes. Baruch, you have it in your house three volumes called Shtile Zetim. It's a commentary on Shulchan Aruch. I have it as well because of you. I kept borrowing your books. I said, at a certain point, I gotta get my own. So I got my own. Uh, it turns out the one that I got, now there's one with ten volumes, but one day at a time. Uh, Shtile Zetim is a commentary on the Shulchan Aruch according to Yemenite halakha, Yemenite commentaries. One thing it doesn't do, it doesn't talk about the Rama at all. Rabbi David Mashlaki's whole point was, if the Yemenites are going to give up their halachot to follow the Shulchan Aruch for the sake of Jewish unity, the Ashkenazim better get ready to give up their customs also. I'm not going to give up mine if you're not going to give up yours. And so his attitude was, we either take the Shulchan Aruch or we don't take the Shulchan Aruch. We're going to start doing our customs. And so he was viewed as the radical Shulchan Aruch rabbi of Yemen. Uh, this is a letter, book of letters from him and his son. The third rabbi was the most famous of all of them. And the more popular, what are the most popular? Probably the vast majority of Yemenite Jews don't belong to the camp of Kapach, nor do they belong to the camp of Rabbi David Mashach. They belong to the camp of the Maharitz. The Maharitz, I read you an article from Rabbi Dr. Ratzon Arusi. The Maharitz is the master of compromise. He sat down and said, there are certain minhagim that have already taken on life from the Shulchan Aruch, from the Kabbalists of Sfat. We can't take them away. You take them away, people are going to fight. There are other things we didn't yet change, like mourning during the Omer. Let's preserve what we can preserve. Let's incorporate what we can incorporate. And like this, we'll keep the peace. Now, that's not really an ideological stance, correct? He's not a Rambamist, nor is he a Shulchan Aruch. Nick. So what is he? He's a master of compromise. Rabbi Ratzon Arusi has an essay in which he claims that men of compromise are usually men of peace. Because, okay, you're right, and you're right, and you're right, and you're also right. Those men are usually the more popular leaders. Because ideological people are usually much more argumentative, warrior-like, exclusive. And he says, always you're going to find that the poskim who compromised in Halakha were the ones who took on life. The greatest example? Who's the greatest example of a posek who compromised all the time? Maran. Shukhan Aruch. Maran is Sephardi. Really, everything should be like the Rambam. But what does he do? We have to take into consideration the Rosh and the Rif, and we'll weigh them, and we'll take two out of three. You should say, that's a crazy system. 
But people are afraid of confrontation. People like when things are, they make everyone feel invited. And so those Chachamim always take on life. This three volume set are letters of the Maharits. How did I get to these letters? Because of the Sidu. This is now a beautiful seven volume set. Baruch, you have an older edition in your house. They've now reprinted these as seven volumes. It used to be four, which used to be one. So it's like the frogs in Egypt. Every time you hit them, the Midrash says they got bigger. The same thing, <laughs> same thing with these books. Uh, Yemenites have been doing a fascinating job. It's very uncharacteristic of, of the Sephardic community. They actually print nice books. I say that with a lot of respect. Um, except for, I don't know why they always have to put ads in the middle of the book, like Mamash on the front page, where the store is located. They're like, you know, we know where we bought the book. In our Seva Torah, down in the Bera Knesset, one of them has advertisements inside of the case of the Seva Torah. It's a classic Israeli thing to put. You never in your life open the Nashkenazi Torah scroll, open it up, there's a 1-800 number inside to buy more Torahs. You never, you never in your life, only Sephardim, we do such things. But there's like a sponsor. <laughs> Fine, you can sponsor, but why, why the advertisement? I don't get it. Uh, this book is a sidu for weekdays and Shabbatot with the commentaries of the Maharit. And yes, I want all seven volumes, but I couldn't carry all seven volumes. And so right now, I'm going to suffice with Shabbat and weekdays. And hopefully by the time I go back for the rest, it won't become 14 volumes. And this is Selichot. You'll see this is the original handwriting of the Maharit on the Selichot. So these are the Selichot, again with the commentaries of the Maharit. I think we could do one more stack. But let me help you choose a stack. Do you have like a five-year plan with this? <laughs> That's a great question. I like those books. I'm getting tired of you showing us more books. So please we can do this quickly. We'll do one, two, three, quick, and we'll finish. <laughs> yeah, we'll finish them all today. Why not? I'll take it out. Thank you, Yitzhak. Can I give you all of these? Yes. I told you you're going to work hard today, right? Yes. I warned him. Yeah. He doesn't deserve it, but I warned him. Min Hagim. I'm not a man of minhagim. You know that. It's always about halachot. So why are minhagim important? Exactly. They tell you why things develop the way they develop. When you look in books of minhagim, you see, everyone knew there was a Rambam, everyone knew there was a Shukhan Aruch, yet somehow the minhag here seems to be different, or it's in accordance with one of those. When you understand that there are types of minhagim, there are minhagim that Idiots, I'm not pointing to you, I'm pointing to the empty chair. The idiots, they make up and they do them. So that's a, not a real minhag. When we talk about minhagim that are valuable, what kind of minhagim are we talking about? <coughs> yeah, for sure from the Talmud. Those are already in a whole different category. When, when I use the colloquial word of minhag, are those that Chachamim instituted? Meaning, the rabbis were aware of what the Shulchan Aruch said. They were aware, but they still chose to practice in a certain way. Those are very important. A number of these books that I have in front of me are books of Minhagi. Uh, an exciting one. Rabbi Chaim Satin. We've studied him before, you just may not know. was a Syrian rabbi who lived later in Israel from 1871 to 1916. He was the Abedin in Sfat. He wrote a book called Eretz Chaim Satin in which he collected all of the different minhagim of the Jewish communities in Israel, namely of the Sephardim. You'll see this quoted, it might even be quoted in my book, Yishalom. There's a section about the Shulchan Aruch, and I believe we quoted him here. This book has has come out from rabbis like Rabbi Yaakov Shavud al-Yashar and uh, Darid Baz, Rabbi Chaim Berlin, who was the chief rabbi of Israel, uh, uh, of Yerushalayim, uh, and of a special chacham, Rabbi Eliyahu Bechor Chazan. When I asked Professor Tzvi Zohar, how did a good Ashkenazi kid get himself wrapped up in Sephardic Judaism? Meaning, how did you go from being this regular Ashkenazi, modern Orthodox guy to becoming the world expert on Sephardic Jewry? How did it happen? Yeah, believe it or not, he's, yeah. Uh, you would never, I mean, he's Mamash the expert. So you want to ask, he's the Chacham you want to go to. I call him Chacham Tzvi. He said he was once in the National Library of Israel, looking through different books. And he came across a tiny little book. You've seen me with it on Shabbat. I read it when I get bored. Meaning, it's a way to entertain. Of Rabbi Eliyahu Bechor Chazan, who was the chief rabbi of Egypt, born in Morocco in Rabat, then became the chief rabbi of Egypt. At the turn of the century, he died in Tel Aviv. 
1928, maybe. 1929. Let me check for you. 1928, he dies in Tel Aviv. And he wrote a play. He went to Algeria to collect money for the Jewish community. And in Algeria, he met these liberated French modern Jews. For him, that was like eye-opening. He never saw such Jews in his life. And he realized that with new Jews came new problems, new issues, new the need to explain things differently, the need to rule on halachot in creative ways. You had a community that was not a captive Jewish community anymore. You had things that you had to figure out, gitin, agunot, all kinds of things that didn't exist before. And so he wrote a book as if there was a rabbi who visited Algeria, and it's a play. It's a real play. There are characters, there are scenes, enter this person, exit this person. It's a book on Torah and halacha, written as a play. It's a beautiful work, and nobody reads it. Rabbi Yahweh Bechor Chazan, this is the book that Tzvi Zohar picked up. And he said, this book made him realize, wait a second, there's a whole world of Jewish literature I've never seen before. That same rabbi wrote this book called Neve Shalom. Neve Shalom is a work of all the minhagim of Egypt. He gave a haskama to this book, so he approved of this book. And Rabbi Yahweh Chazan came back to Israel. There was talk about making him the chief rabbi of Israel, but the zealots didn't want him. The zealots claimed he was too open-minded, and they managed to get him removed as a candidate for the Sephardic chief rabbi, and the rest is already history. Uh, one of his colleagues in Egypt, maybe a little after him, <coughs> uh, Rabbi Raphael <coughs> Aharon ben Shimon, wrote these two books. You've heard me mention him in my class in the Sanhedrin. They tried to refound the Sanhedrin in his generation. There was an Ashkenazi rabbi in Egypt, Rabbi Aharon, Mendel HaKohen. When the Ashkenazi community fired him and kicked him to the streets, Rabbi Raphael Aharon ben Shimon brought him onto the Sephardic Bedin. On every letter from the Sephardic Bedin, you see two Sephardic rabbis and one Ashkenazi rabbi. Because the Sephardim employed him when the Ashkenazim got rid of him. Was there an Ashkenazi community in Cairo? You better believe it. In, all, in Egypt, there was a, a, not a large, but there was a significant Ashkenazi community uh, to the point that they had their own cemetery, their own shechita, and such other things. <coughs> These are books that he wrote, one about the Chachamim of Egypt, and two, there were many new problems of divorce that were happening, people getting civil divorces, not necessarily getting gitin. And so these are books that he wrote about life in Egypt. Responded to issues of the time. That's absolutely right. And uh, he named the books very sarcastic names. They are acronyms of... The book has two parts. One, the wife who divorces her husband because he's a bad man. And the wife who divorces her husband because she's a bad woman. There are two, there, I mean, there's two different sides to every divorce, and he was trying to deal with both. Unfortunately, the second book has been lost to us. We have no copies of it anywhere. It's for sure floating in a library somewhere, but there is no copy in any national library, any university library, so we only have the first half of this book and not the second half. That's a great question. I should ask him. I have no idea. I don't know. Uh, Yitzhak, we're going to finish this tonight, even because anyways people are sleeping, so we could just zoom through. These books are the oldest books that I have here on this table. Oldest, Rav Saad Yagon. Rav Sadia Gaon, Rabbi Yitzhak Nisim's Institute, put out a collection of the different fragmented manuscripts we have of his halachic writings. What can I tell you about them? When Rabbi Yosef Zernigian comes, he will fill you in on ancient manuscripts of Rabbi Sadia Gaon. This is right up his alley. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Uh, Rabbi David Kohen Skali. You know, there are many people that think they're Kohanim, and they're not really Kohanim. When you hear the last name, Kohen Skali, you know they are what we call Kohanim. Miuchasim. They have, they go back in the Yichus, they're genuine Kohanim. Rabbi David Kohen Skali was the rabbi of Oran, Algeria, from 1862 to 1948. Uh, Rabbi Yosef Masas calls him Hamelech David Kohen, the King David the Kohen. Uh, he wrote two beautiful volumes on Halakha. He has other books, but he just reprinted these. Mamash, they're brand new. It's called Kiryat Chana David. And when he 
felt that he was going to pass away, he asked his family to come. He asked his wife to wash his hands. He gave a speech to his family, said Shema Yisrael, and passed away. Uh, he knew when he was going to pass. He was the rabbi in Oran, Algeria. Uh, this Chacham, we had a whole seminar on him in uh, our rabbinic conference in Yerushalayim. My parents bought me this book, so I thank them very much. Uh, this was not my own shopping. Uh, this book was signed by Professor Rabbi Professor Moshe Amma, who reprinted the book. Um, Rabbi Yudah ibn Atar is not related to Rabbi Chaim ibn Atar, at least not directly in some way that we know. Uh, Atar means? In Arabic? Yeah, very good. Uh, Bisamim. Uh, and that's like a, a Roma. Oh, very, very good. So, so that's probably where his family was working at. I mean, they were involved in the perfume industry. Uh, he was a the chief rabbi of Fez and of Miknas. He lived from 1655 and 1733. And the importance of this work is telling you a lot of how things shifted in that part of the region of the world and new issues regarding money, inheritances. And this is influential in Edith. We once had a conversation about daughters inheriting from their fathers and whether how that works. And there were different rules in different communities. And a lot of that is discussed here in this work. This brings me to Takanot Chachmei Fez. I wanted to get my hands on Takanot Chachmei Marrakesh, but the second volume is only one in print, and I don't buy broken sets. Uh, Takanot Chachmei Fez started being written in the year 1494. What happens in 1494? It's near 1492. It's the first time communities of Spanish Jews find themselves in Morocco, namely in Fez. What's the problem? What problem do you have when one Jewish group meets another Jewish group? Language and custom. Language and customs. So language, likely, they were able to communicate, but customs, there were major, different, major custom differences between the Jews of Spain and the Jews of Morocco. The Moroccans being, some say, a little stricter. The Spaniards being a little more open. Some say that's not exactly the way that works, and I'm not going to stick my head in this argument. But already in 1494... The Chachamim of these groups of Jews decided to standardize Jewish practice in certain ways. This book was written from 1494 until 1948. All of the Takanot, the standardizations of Halakha, the uh, rules like not being able to take your child out of school before a certain age uh, because all children need education, rules regarding finances, rules regarding inheritances, rules regarding kashrut, and so on and so forth. All of those things are codified here. If you look at a healthy Jewish community, like the ones in North Africa, you will find two things. One, we're very lucky that Ashkenazi rabbis didn't read our books. Because if they did, they would call us Reform Jews, or whatever, they, whatever title they like to call people who change things. Meaning, meaning, they felt completely empowered in the halachic realm to make halacha work for whatever community they were dealing with. It's something which is, is not done today. Uh, the second you see that in a healthy Jewish community, there are solutions to every problem. When the Chachamim are really scholars, and when they work together, and the communities and the Chachamim have a healthy relationship with each other, you can solve pretty much any halachic problem. 1948, why is the book stopped being written in 1948? It's the first time in Sephardic history where we no longer have communities that follow halacha. 1948 meant there was a new Jew in Israel, halachic codes went out the window, and all kinds of strange and foreign Israeli laws took their place. And this is the downfall of a system that worked so well and then was taken apart. Perhaps our last book for the night. This is it, Cheva. Why we ended with this, we'll figure it out. I have, I think the Chida wrote some 57 books. I have all of them in my home. Rabbi Chaim Yosef David Azulai. You may for sure have heard of Rabbi Chaim Sefer Dezulai, one of the most influential Sephardic rabbis in the world. The Chida, as we call him, wrote many, 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 many works, and most of his life he was traveling from place to place to place. Uh, for example, when he, was in, he, has, he had a very good sense of humor. When he was in Pisa, you know Pisa? I'm saying it right? The Tower of Pisa. The Leaning Tower of Pisa. He printed only one book there. Most of his books were printed in Livorno, in Leghorn. He printed one book in Pisa. And that book he called it <coughs> Chomat Anach, the straight up wall. Meaning, 
it was like mocking that it was printed in a play. Everything is crooked, but the Torah is straight. It's a certain type of uh, humor of the Chida. The Chida has a very small work called Ma'agal Tov. Ma'agal Tov is a, a collection of all the places he stopped. Elul 18, Elul 17, Elul 19. Short notes, diary of, I went here, I went there, I traveled to this country, I met this rabbi, I met this person, I collected money here, my clothes were dirty there, all kinds of things. Uh, inter- uh, that's interesting. I, I don't know if this was like a style once upon a time to, to write. It doesn't seem, unlike other journal, journal, journeyers, what do you call it? Travelers, sojourners, like Rabbi Yaakov Sapir, who went to record history. He was just keeping notes. He wasn't necessarily recording the history for everybody. Uh, but he wrote all of these entries in his diary. And, you know, you read them, but I don't know where half these places are. I don't know who half these people are. I don't even know. There's many words he's borrowing from Italian, from Spanish, from Greek, all kinds of words. I have no idea what they are. And this book caught my eye in Israel. Someone started taking apart this book. And section by section, this is the first volume of what will be a few more volumes, uh, walking you through the Chida's travels with pictures, with translations of places. Uh, I want to give you an example. So he's here, he's in Egypt. Uh, that's Rabbi Raphael Aaron Ben Shimon. Uh, here he's in Egypt. Here he's in Italy. Next he travels to Ashkenaz, to Germany. You then find him, uh, he spends time there in Holland. That's Rabbi Menashe Ben Israel, uh, the famous rabbi that I told you about who grew up in a family of Anusim. Uh, and then and that's Rabbi Yaakov Sasportas, one of the main warriors against Shabtai Tzvi. Probably the only warrior against Shabtai Tzvi. Uh, he then continues into Holland. From Holland, he goes to England. Uh, that's Bevis Marks Synagogue in London, where he visited. Uh, you then have him in France and in Italy, and that's where this. And then back to Israel. But the book is not over. What they do here is they tell you every place. Like I saw where Haya. What is Haya? He tells you that's Hag, but that's how he wrote it in his in his Hebrew, and that's how it was pronounced perhaps in his language then, uh, or the clothing that he's wearing in Turkey, what does it look like, or the buildings that he saw, or the dates, what are they, or the personalities that he mentions. And so this is a fascinating work of Jewish history that is for the first time in 250 years being unpacked so that the student of Jewish history today can actually walk through and not just read stories, but understand how we got to where we are today. And so to wrap up today's shiur, I took you to a bunch of different countries with a bunch of different chachamim. And I would like to thank all of you not just for your patience but thank you for giving us this corner of the universe in which we can study the writings of an eccentric and eclectic group of Chamim from all across the spectrum there are no names that are not allowed here there are no countries that are not studied here there are only there's only a desire to grow to learn to incorporate and to better the beautiful Torah and Judaism that we already have and I hope that with your blessing, Bezat Hashem, and with the guidance of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that we can incorporate all of the Sfarim that we got here into the Shirim that we're learning, only to enrich them and to enhance them, to make HaKadosh Baruch Hu proud, and hopefully to end up where we started, which is in Harabayt, with the Bed Mikdash that should happen to us very, very soon. Bezat Hashem. Zag Ben Matz.